We had some issues with Eric Bieniemy's game flow in week three. Did it get any better in week four? I'll tell you how I saw it coming on next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into today's episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. And don't forget that you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can continue this conversation with me by becoming a Locked On Commanders insider at jointsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. And from there, you can text me any day, anytime, your uh, latest and greatest football thoughts. And I'm your host of this program, David Harrison, on Twitter at dharrison82, credential member of the media covering your Washington Commanders for Commander Country. Dot com, a part of Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation here with you every Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. As always, appreciate your continued support for the show. Today's episode brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. that helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL. It's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. On today's episode, we're going to dive into Ron Rivera's comments on moral victories, and we're going to hit our AAR for the Commanders Week 4 loss to the Philadelphia Eagles. But first, my off-the-top reactions to the game, and while this isn't immediately following the game, there are some thoughts I had while watching from home. And as as some of you know, the Everdayers, as you know, I was not at the game in Philadelphia. recently suffered a loss in my family, so I took some time to uh, kind of rebound from that, which is also why this episode is dropping on Tuesday morning. Um, But I do have plans to have as as many episodes as I possibly can. I do have to uh, potentially take a break at some point in, uh, in time in the near future, uh, to travel for uh, some final goodbyes. But more on that as it comes, just bear with me, guys. It's kind of a day-to-day situation. I appreciate the outpouring of, of condolences and support that I've received from uh, people on YouTube, Twitter, and especially from my insiders who who have been texting me uh, their well wishes as well. But I was watching the Washington Commanders versus Philadelphia Eagles game from my home, uh, just like many of you uh, were as well. And I did keep track of my off the top thoughts as the game was going on. So I give them to you authentically. So the first thought I kind of had right off the top of the game, confidence refueled in Eric B even if just a little bit, right? So I don't think that Eric B from week three to week four necessarily, it's not like he sat down and listened to locked on commanders and took all the notes and said, okay, I'm going to do exactly what David Harrison says, because if he did, honestly, he probably get fired pretty soon. Uh, and that's not what Eric B is out there to do, but we did have some issues with the way that Eric Bieniemy ran his offense week three against the Buffalo Bills. That's kind of what we do. Uh, Washington on in week four against Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I think the offense obviously operated much better from Sam Howell and from the offensive execution standpoint in general. But I did notice some improvements as far as personal preferences, what we want to see from the Washington Commanders offense as well. Washington had 27 first and 10s on Sunday against Philadelphia Eagles. 13 of those were run plays. So pretty much about as, as much of a 50-50 split as you can get. Uh, in that category. Brian Robinson Jr. combined to have 10 touches on those first downs uh, between tar- targets and touches, rather. Uh, had 10 of those in the first half. He had five in second half, one in overtime, which is better. It's an improvement, right? It's more B-Rob, but I think we still want to see more, even more Brian Robinson uh, if we can. Don't go down the down, uh, down the road in the future. Robinson did outsnap Antonio Gibson in this week's game. He was outsnapped by AG uh, against the Buffalo Bills. Robinson had 43 offensive snaps. AG had 30. Brian Robinson up from 20. So I had more than twice uh, the amount of snaps he did in week three and week four. Clearly, there was a good mix of run and pass with Robinson in the game. But last week, there was way too much AG uh, passing going on when AG was on the field. In week four, Antonio Gibson again played 30 snaps, ran the ball four times, while Robinson ran the ball 14 times on 43 Robinson's run pass split, 33% run. The rest were passes with Robinson on the field. Antonio Gibson, 13% run. The rest were pass. Still think that's a little too pass heavy for just having one dude on the field. The defense can key in on Antonio Gibson as a receiving threat uh, way too easy. And look, there's there's got to be a natural concern uh, of the fumbling issues that Antonio Gibson has shown in the past. And in the past, so you want to use him as a receiver more than you want a ball carrier. I get that. But I also think there is a flaw in, in making your offense so one-dimensional and there's a certain running back on the field versus trying to mix it up a little bit. If you if you like AG as a receiver, honestly, I say put them both in the backfield, right? You guys know every day is especially uh, people who have been watching this program or listening to this program for a while. I'm, I'm all about two back sets, especially when you've got a, a thumper uh, type of running back and Brian Robinson and you've got a quicker receiving type of back 
and Antonio Gibson. Put them both in the backfield, make the defense pick their poison uh, and go from there. Meanwhile, Derek Gore, in place of Chris Rodriguez Jr., who was inactive due to an illness, Derek Gore was active, got six offensive snaps, no carries, also had no targets, but that means that every pass or every play that he was on the field for uh, was a pass play. And again, you know, that's only six snaps and, you know, the defense keying in on Derek Gore, not as big of a concern, but still would like to see a little bit more of Brian Robinson. We certainly got some more. Uh, would like to see a little bit more of a run pass uh, uh, equitable type of uh, decision making from Eric Bien. I mean, when Antonio Gibson is on the field, but I think that, you know, it's it's an improvement, and that's really all you can ask for when it comes to stylistic type of, of offenses, right? It got better against Philadelphia, and I think we clearly saw some benefits from that. Now, did have someone tell me that they didn't like the first down run in overtime, right? And that's kind of contradictory because we've been asking for more run, more Brian Robinson. But in the game flow, especially in overtime, you've got four quarters of evidence to use. Only three of the 13 first down and 10 runs on Sunday were successful. It's 23%. Uh, eight of the 14 pass plays called on first and 10 were successful. It's 47%. So uh, now Howell had also been sacked on two of the first and 10 pass calls. So if you count those as deductive plays and you're still left with a 43% success rate on first and 10 when you're dialing up passes. So I get why people would want to see a pass on first and 10 there in overtime instead of a run, especially with the way that game specifically was going. Uh, so, you know, are we being a little nitpicky here? Maybe, but you know what? That's that's the benefit of, of looking from the outside. And at the end of the day, the offense was in position to win. And if Jahan Dotson doesn't drop that third down pass while Washington is leading, that takes them around midfield, gives them a new set of downs. It's possible Washington doesn't even need that late tight end late in the game or tight end touchdown late in the game uh, to, to tie up the score. We'll never know, of course. It's just a possibility. Jahan Dotson clearly taking responsibility for that after the game as well, but did again bounce back, make the touchdown catch uh, at the end of the game to tie it. So bottom line is, I think we saw a better offensive game plan from Eric Bieniemy, game flow from EB as a play caller. Even if I don't necessarily agree with everything, I think that can't be the standard to say, well, I want to agree with everything. I want him to do exactly what I want him to do. So being fair, seeing more of those things and then seeing the offense, again, in the position to win the game, I think you have to be a little bit happy with what Eric Bieniemy pulled out week four against the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, and, you know, that's his first time coordinating this offense against that defense. So when we see it again, we'll look to see uh, not if there's any, necessarily any differences, but more so any improvements. Uh, so that was my first off the top item. My second off the top item, have opposing offenses figured out the defense. That was kind of my question coming into this game. Or are the opposing defenses, opposing offenses rather, just getting better, right? There's something, this is something I think we'll have a definitive answer for Thursday night against Chicago Bears. Because up until now, right, you go Arizona Cardinals offense, Denver Broncos offense, Bills offense, Eagles offense. Literally, you're getting better and better offenses as the weeks come in. So. It's not a complete surprise to see that Washington had eight quarterback hits, three sacks in week one, and 14 hits, seven sacks in week two. But then that drops to one hit, no sack in week three, six hits, three sacks in week four is better. Uh, but still, you want it, you want it to be uh, a little bit better if you can. The question moving to the rest of the season is whether or not the dip in sack and hit performance the last two weeks versus the first two weeks is a question of whether or not offenses are figuring out this defense or if it's just a matter of uh, of competition getting better. The Chicago Bears offense is a is in a mess. So if this Washington Commanders defense doesn't get constant pressure, doesn't get a good amount of sacks against Justin Fields and the Chicago Bears, then we'll start looking a little bit more at maybe the, these offenses are figuring out this defense. Number three, uh, can Sam Howell string two big performances together? Now, I truly was thinking about this during the course of the game, but... Honestly, it's a perk of or a drawback, I guess, depending on you look at it, of being at home watching it versus being at the stadium watching it. And, and you know, again, given the kind of circumstances and what I've been going through, I wasn't charting everything that I usually chart in the stadium. I was kind of watching it like a football fan. And one of my insiders even said, this is almost like texting your buddies, just watching a game, just kind of enjoying football again. And I really appreciated that and kind of took it that way. But when you talk about the roller coaster that young quarterback brings with him, Sam Howe is literally alternated worse and better performances in his five career starts so far. So using his first week, week 18 last year against the Dallas Cowboys, as the starting point, he had an 83 overall quarterback rating. Against Arizona, that dropped to 77.6, a 5.4 point drop. Then it rose against Denver to 108.8, dropped again against Buffalo to 41.5, a bigger drop from, from 108.8, uh, a 67.3 point drop, and then rose again against the Eagles, uh, to 98.6. So his career tendencies say that his next start this Thursday night against Chicago Bears uh, is going to dip. But how big could that dip be? That's the question. And also the question against the Chicago Bears is there going to be a dip? On average, his falls drop 36.35 points, which would drop him from 98.6 against the Philadelphia Eagles to 62.25, 
against the Chicago Bears, which is basically a performance right between what he did against Arizona and right between what he did against Buffalo, Arizona being the high point in that uh, performance uh, spectrum. Would that be enough to beat Chicago? You would like to say pretty much anything is good enough to beat Chicago, right? But interestingly enough, so far this season, the lowest quarterback rating to beat the Bears was Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Baker Mayfield to finish with a 114.5. The good news is the lowest quarterback rating the Chicago Bears defense has allowed is a 114.5. So it's not so much that it took a 114.5 to beat them. It's the Bears defense has given up a lot of high QBRs. 114.5 happens to be the lowest. So if ever there was an opportunity for Sam Howell to get his first back-to-back positive high QBR rating performance in his starting career, this is the week to do it, but it's coming on Thursday night, guys. And you know, Thursday nights can be a little crazy. Coming up next, we're going to combine our AAR comment with our off the top segment. And we're going to do that coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Commanders brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. And that's why you need to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. And add your job and the purple hashtag, ha- hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Continuing on with today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders first listen today and every day. Every dayers, appreciate you as well. Tomorrow, we've got a mailbag coming up before we get to our crossover Thursday and it's game night uh, all over again. If you want to send in a question for the mailbag, episode drop in on Wednesday, drop it in the YouTube comments, send them to me on Twitter at dharrison82, or just text me directly by becoming a lock insider at joinsubtext.com slash locked on commanders. That's a lock for it. Locked on commanders, uh, not locked on podcast. No, we're just, just a happy coincidence. Uh, because of the reduced week, we're back at practice on Tuesday. So while you're watching this, most likely I'm probably gonna be at practice, which is usually a day off, but then we're off Wednesday. So I'll do my mailbag episode on Wednesday. I do have wizards practice training camp on Wednesday, so I'll, I'll fit that in where I can. Uh, we're going to get into our AAR episode here, though. Usually we do our right off the top and then some other observations from the game. Then we do our AAR the day after because of the condensed timeline. We're going to combine them here, starting with my sustain from week four. My sustain is going to be tr- trusting the inner circle of the Washington Commanders coaching staff. So go for it on fourth down or not, right? That's always a big question. I didn't like it in Denver. I was wrong. They got the touchdown. They ended up winning. Most people didn't agree with me at the time either. Uh, it happens. Didn't like it against Buffalo. I was right. Most people agreed with me that they should have taken the points, built some momentum, built a little bit of positive energy. Uh, I didn't like it against Philly. I was wrong. They scored. Uh, I'd say most people disagreed with me, although it's not a huge sticking point because of the decision that came later. The good news is Ron Rivera is not worried about what I think. He's worried about what he sees, hears, and what his people that he trusts in those positions are telling him. Uh, and in kind of, and he kind of detailed that process on Monday when he was asked about not going for two at the end of uh, regulation against the Eagles. We'll talk about it here in just a minute. But Ron said this. He said, quote, I talk to a lot of people when it comes, when it's time to make a decision. First of all, I go through it in my head. I have a checklist that I go through on Sunday mornings that I review. I go through some things with Eric that we talk about. When we got, in, got to that situation, I asked everybody's opinion. I listened to what was said. I was, it was a collaborative effort thing that's crazy about it is we won the toss and we had a chance to win. That's all you can ask is that you have an opportunity. We had an opportunity. We had a great play on the sideline. I'm just kind of disappointed that before it even went to replay, that it was determined that he was out of bounds. For me, it's a tough one right there because it was a hell of a throw and a great catch. End quote. Uh, I'll say this. In the moment, I wanted Ron Rivera to go for two. While I'm sitting there on my couch, uh, I was saying to Ron, go for two. Try to try to end this game. Uh, it was a really good drive. Momentum was on your side. And you had the feeling that if you go to overtime and Philly gets the ball first, they'd likely score. If they'll score a touchdown, you get the chance to answer. But now your young quarterback, your young offense is in a situation where they have to answer back uh, against a really good team. And, and that just puts them at a disadvantage, right? So go for the jugular while you get to while the momentum on your side. Take the win. Uh, also, the short week on, on Thursday night football coming up against the Bears, playing a whole quarter or even a half a quarter more of, of competitive football, not ideal. So that's what my initial thoughts were in the moment. 
But then after the game, he said his guys were gassed, right? He says office players were gassed. It was a long drive and it was 10 plays, 65 yards, but they were running up and down the field. I mean, it's no huddle, quick snaps. You know what I mean? Like they're going up and down. Uh, before he said Monday that he talks with people about these sessions, these, these decisions, I knew it wasn't just a Ron decision by himself. Because remember back in training camp, he talked about taking timeouts, conserving clock, burning clock, all these things. And we actually saw a part of practice where him and the people he talks to, they actually huddled up on the field as the players were kind of waiting and saying like, hey, what are we going to do? Because they were in a two-minute drive situation. And the coaches actually took the time to kind of have this conversation about the game situation. And Ron said like, it was just as important for them to practice that as coaches as it is for the players. And I thought it was really interesting. So I kind of already knew that this was a collaborative uh, effort. And I'll tell you, I think that if EB was adamant, like really adamant about going for the two-point conversion, I think Ron Rivera would have let him. Um, I really believe that. So I don't have confirmation that Eric Bieniemy wasn't adamant about it, but I just believe that if he was, he probably would have let him. Um, and at the end of the day, Ron's right. They did have a chance to win. That's that catch on the sideline. I think it was a catch. I think it should have been ruled a catch. Um, you know, unfortunately, it was ruled incomplete and it ended up held on uh, review. On that note, I would think that the way the NFL is, has has focused on offense and kind of made rules to, to enhance the offense that you would want those close calls on the field to be called receptions let it be ruled an incompletion on review if need be. But obviously, while it would help Washington in this situation, it would also bite them in the butt sometime down the road. So, you know, you, you can only ask for what you ask for. Uh, but Logan Paulson said something on the team's in-house post-game show that I thought was actually really interesting. Uh, and it was really interesting because the first time I've ever watched it, because again, I was actually at home. And Logan said he would have gone for two as well, which I know a lot of people would have gone for two or wanted the coach to go for two. But he also talked about how he doesn't have even close to the amount of information that Ron Rivera has on the sideline. So he respects Ron's decision. So I'm, I'm going to go the same way here. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop have, have been, having my own opinions. doesn't mean you need to stop having your own opinions. Only that I would much rather this coaching staff make decisions based off their collective. They know their guys. They know the scheme. They know the game flow. They know what they're all thinking in the moment on the sideline instead of worrying about, well, are the fans going to like this? Or is the media going to like this? I would much rather Coach Rivera and his staff continue making decisions the way that they are right now. My improve. Linebacker Jamin Davis. And, and look, you know, Jamin's not the only one that had any flaws in this game specifically, but I've been biting my tongue all season long. Wanted to give it the first quarter to kind of really see what we saw. Uh, but too many times when something positive happened for the other side, I see something negative happening with Jamin Davis this season. I'm not saying it's all on him. Not even close, right? But you got six first-round picks on that defense. And the only one consistently out of place, out of position, getting beat in his one-on-one -on -one assignments from what I'm seeing is Jamin Davis. Even Emmanuel Forbes, if you don't expect some growing pains from a first-year cornerback, arguably the second hardest position to convert to the NFL from college in, I don't know what to tell you, but even him, I've seen a lot of positives and a lot of potential in Emmanuel Forbes that I just don't see enough from Jamin Davis in a fourth-year first-round pick. Uh, multiple times this year, I've seen plays where Jamin Davis is lagging behind a play where his effort could have significantly reduced a game. There's a play specifically earlier in the season where if he's putting in the effort to chase down a play from behind, a, a what ended up being an explosive run is stopped for about a six or seven yard gain. And we know what's it between six or seven yards and more than 10 yards. It's only about five yards, but in the game of inches that five yards can be huge. And you don't know what happens moving on in the game, or he potentially comes up. I've seen this team work on it, come up from behind peanut punch that ball out or try to cause a fumble. Now he did force a fumble earlier in the season. It was a big fumble. It was critical and he deserves praise for that. But as a first round pick in his fourth season, that's the type of effort. Those are the type of plays that we need to see on a more consistent basis. We should be talking about this first round pick impacting games at this point in his career, not impacting plays, especially if you're going to consider playing, paying this man, what, more than $12 million by picking up his fifth round, uh, fifth year option at the end of the season. He's growing, certainly. But if you look at it from last year to this year, uh, you're more happy. But if you look at it from the microscope of this is a fourth round or fourth year uh, or third year, first round pick about to head into his fourth year. This player should be making a lot more impact plays than he is. And again, like I said, we should be talking about him impacting games, not impacting one play, two plays here uh, a game. And certainly talking about him blowing one or two more plays a game uh, and in the same breath. So 13 games to go would certainly love to see Jamie Davis make me eat my words. You know what I mean? That would make me more than happy uh, to do so. But so far, through four games, I want to give it four games before I gave an assessment. Through four games, not not happy with what we've seen from again a, a first round draft pick linebacker in his third round in his third year. And I know it's not his fault that he's a first round pick, 
You know what I mean? Um, but it, it, it is what it is. That situation that you're in, you want this team to pick up your fifth year option. You need to show them uh, that you're worthy of it by making those plays and not making some of the other mistakes that you're making along the way, like taking a really bad angle, not securing the edge on a critical overtime run. Uh, speaking of eating words, like I hope to do with what I just said about Jamin Davis, a few quarters of season from now, Rod Rivera says some things on his Monday in his Monday press conference. We're going to talk about one C of Rod Rivera is going to eat his words on this one. Coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Commanders brought to you by FanDuel. Snap back into the action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. And currently, the Washington Commanders are seven-point favorites to beat the Chicago Bears at home this Thursday night. So you bet that 200 or you bet $5 on that game. Uh, win or lose, you get $200 in bonus bets. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in the action than right now. The app is easy to use. The website is easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season in style. FanDuel, official partner of the National Football League. All right, guys, time to rant about Ron Rivera a little bit. And I, the, the quote that I picked out for this episode from Ron Rivera's press conference on Monday was his conversation about moral victories. This is something that has been talked about a lot uh, around the Washington Commanders media circle uh, here in, in recent weeks, especially with the Bills coming. Uh, the game against Philadelphia was coming up, a young quarterback, a new offense, all these things. Moral victories, right? And and I've said it on this program before, and I'll, I'll continue to say it. Moral victories are something that, Fans can acknowledge, media can acknowledge, but typically you don't see the team acknowledge them. Asked about moral victories. Oh, well, it wasn't asked about moral victories, but Ron Rivera talked about moral victories in one of his answers during his Monday press conference. Ron said, quote, it's kind of tough because we went in expecting to win. I mean, every game is a must win. Every game you got to go in with the attitude that you're going to win, and that's how we felt. I think it's been kind of tough because people come up and say, man, I'm real proud of the way you played. Well, hell, we didn't win, and I think that's the bottom line. I think that's how the guys really felt because they played hard. They played their hearts out. They wanted to win. I think in every case, I believe they expected to win. They really did. And not getting the W is a hard pill to swallow. I think that's really what the sense is and what the meaning is that there was no moral victory, end quote. And I think from a competitive standpoint, that's exactly what you want to hear. And that's that's what you saw in the locker room, you know, speaking to some other media members who were in Philadelphia while I was not. Uh, they talked about going to the locker room, and it was just a very somber uh, atmosphere. You know what I mean? This wasn't a team that said, oh, man, hey, we gave it our best. Hey, man, we went blow to blow with the Super Bowl team. Hey, man, we almost won. We only lost by three, and we were, you know, uh, eight and a half point underdogs. We covered the spread. Go us. That wasn't the atmosphere. The atmosphere was we lost the game, and we lost the game. We feel like we could have won or should have won. You know what I mean? And and that's that's the attitude you want. So. I'm going to talk about the moral victories. I'm going to talk about the growth in Sam Howell. I'm going to talk about the better offensive play. And I'm going to talk about all those things. But at the end of the day, the team is going to talk about, here's what helped us fail. Here's what helped us lose a game that we should have won. Here's why we should have won. Here's why we didn't. Here's how we get better to win the next time around. And that's what you need. Because if you have a team, an organization, whether it be a locker room, coaches, GM, owners, anybody inside the organization walking around saying, hey, man, that was a really good game, really good effort. We almost pulled it off. You're going to lose. You're going to lose more games because of that attitude. You look at the other side of the competition, quarterback Jalen Hurts, and I know we don't like praising the Eagles, but there's a story out there, and I don't know if it still is, but the story is that Jalen Hurts took a photo of the confetti falling on the Kansas City Chiefs at the end of the, at the, end of the Super Bowl. That photo that he took leaving the Super Bowl as a loser is his phone screenshot. It's like his wallpaper on his cell phone. Right now, now he was asked about it and he said, I'm not going to talk to people why that's my photo. But I think the, the logical connection there is I want to remember what it felt like to lose that game because I don't ever want to feel that again. And that's his motivation. So every day, every week, every time he opens a cell phone, he's reminded of we didn't do enough. Getting to the Super Bowl is not enough because to quote the great Ricky Bobby, you're either first or you're last. Right. And as far as Jalen Hurts is concerned, they were last last year. The Washington Commanders, as far as they're concerned, they lost a game to a division rival. Sam Howell mentioned it before the game. It's a twofer because you have the opportunity to win a game and you also have the opportunity to hand your division opponent a loss. Well, if it's a twofer in the positive, it's twofer in the negative. Not only did you lose, but your division opponent won. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's a good way for the team to be looking at it. And, and that's a positive way to be doing it. And it'll help them get back on the winning streak. 
or winning side of things against Chicago. Uh, and then you've got some other games, Atlanta, New England, uh, certainly some winnable games coming up as well down the line. Speaking of which, I will be doing, uh, again, kind of a day-to-day situation over here, but time consider or time willing, uh, time allowing, I will be doing my second quarter preview uh, of the Washington Commanders. I will uh, do that hopefully before we get to Thursday night against the Chicago Bears. For now, that's going to wrap up today's episode. Coming up tomorrow, we've got a mailbag episode. So if you've got questions or comments, Throw them in the YouTube comment section. Hit me on Twitter or text me as a Locked On Commanders insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. As always, thank you for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Every day, thanks for coming through on a consistent basis like you do. Thank you so much for making me a part of your day, part of your football routine. Until we speak again, please be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Mm-hmm.